We're four friends with hot takes on food media. And we're here to review and recap all kinds of food shows in bite-sized seasons. Plus, virtual potlucks, cooking adventures, and food memes. Welcome to Pot Appetit Gourmet Takes. Hi, I'm Amanda. Hey, it's Justine. And it's me, Meg. Welcome to Pod Appetit Gourmet Takes, where we review and recap all kinds of food shows in bite-sized seasons. This season, we have been covering Stump Sola with Sola O'Whaley. In each episode, Sola's knowledge and creativity are put to the test in a twisted cooking challenge. Sola uses a big old game show style wheel to put a spin on the dish she has to create. And we've been asking the whole time, will the challenge stump Sola? On today's menu, we're doing a virtual potluck! Woo! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> At the end of each season, we make a dish from or inspired by the show that we just covered. So we're all doing our spins on stump mm. Sola today. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love potluck episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. And so since this episode is all about what we made, we're going to get to it. I'm going to go first. I'm going to send pictures over to my lovely pals. I did Sad Birthday. Happy birthday (laughs) to you. If you see at the start, I did the mise en place. I set up all my things together. Very nice. I forgot to grab some of the measuring cups, but they were like really close by, so it wasn't a big deal. What recipe did you use? I did not do the specific one that Sola did. So I used an easy one bowl vanilla cake birthday cake from Food Play Go. I was trying to find something that was like similar in like the regular vanilla cake because I knew I was going to dye it and stuff. But I also didn't, since there's no stand mixer here, I was like, I don't want to mess with trying to do like the hand mix and everything this time. I was like, I'm just going to use elbow grease for whatever I do. So I like whisked everything myself. It's basically like most cake recipes, I think, where you have like the dry ingredients and the wet ingredients separate. Mm -hmm. I whisked together the dry ingredients, melted some butter, whisked in all the wet ingredients together and then combined. And then as you can see, (laughs) I started adding the dye and I had to make a sad face for sad (laughs) birthday. Okay, I was going to ask if that was intentional because I was thought this food dye looks like it's making a little frowny face. It is! It's on purpose. Can you describe the, the color change occurring? Yeah, so I started with blue and green because those are the sad colors. And I made a sad face and I mixed those together and then it had very much like a a kind of teal. And then um, I added red and if you can see the red, I put in a B for blood because that's also sad. (laughs) Um, I was having fun, guys. So as we discussed in the earlier episodes, the episode where we covered sad birthday, Sola makes the cake gray and sad looking by using activated charcoal. And I'm guessing that your end goal here is also to achieve a gray black color, but with food dye. Yes, mine was also to achieve a gray color. But as Meg and I had discussed when we talked about that episode, activated charcoal can mess with birth control and with depression meds. And as I take both of those, I thought, I don't want to throw the dice and (laughs) accidentally mess up my meds. So I just went with good old fashioned food dye and it turned very gray. And so I put it into the two cake pans and I baked it. And the recipe said 25 to 30 minutes or until like you press on it and it bounces back. Mm -hmm. It took a lot longer than that. The oven was 325. So I wonder if it should have been like 350. This is the first time. So as I've mentioned on the podcast at, uh, while I've been staying at my mom's, the the stove, like the oven broke and was on fire. And so my mom got a new (laughs) one. (laughs) And this was my first time baking in the new one. So the settings on it are very strange on how you have to set it to bake and then do a timer. And then when I was trying to do a five minute timer to like recheck them at some point, it somehow bumped up to 500 degrees. And I was like, no, that's not (laughs) what I want you to do. I don't feel like it was so much me messing up 
like on how to combine the ingredients and things as much as it was like me struggling with a new oven. Also with yellow or white cakes, when you dye them or color them, it's harder to know visually when it's done because you probably have some experience knowing what a vanilla cake looks like when it's baked and it's got that nice golden light golden color yeah but when you have a gray cake i mean what do you look for to to show you that it's done (laughs) exactly that's why i was really going for kind of like that bounce back and like Mm -hmm. sliding in i think you can see in the one picture once i took them out you can kind of see where i'd put a knife in to check and see if it was dry or if it was still like soggy inside now i couldn't do like peter from jabibo and like listen i don't have that skill (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's so awesome, though. I'm I'm so proud of you. you. I feel like you've come so far in that you're just not like, okay, the recipe said put it in for this amount of time, so I take it out with that amount of time. It's like you're you're really testing it, like you said, using all of your senses, mm-hmm. which is cooking, baking, law. <laughs> so yeah, then I it said to let them cool in the pan for five minutes, but I let them sit for ten since they had baked longer than the recipe said. Um, And then I flipped them out onto parchment paper and let them cool there for a little bit. The recipe was like, then you can put them in the fridge for four hours or overnight, or you can do this. So I instead Mm -hmm. just wrapped it in parchment paper and put it in the freezer to cool it down faster because I've seen that on cake shows. So (laughs) I realized I did not take a picture of when I like layered them, but in between, because I knew it would be sweet like really sweet, I put lemon curd in between the two layers. Yeah, Yeah, I was gonna ask if there was something in there because there looks like there's something in there. Yeah, I put lemon curd in between so that there was like a tartness to counterbalance the sweet. And then I will admit, I did not home make my frosting. I got confetti frosting from the grocery store and then I dyed it gray. So that it had, I just thought it was funny to have like the gray, but then like the confetti against the gray in the frosting. I thought it was funny. I have to say that's my one critique here, Amanda. It's just too much fun. It's just too happy. (laughs) Too happy. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And so. I'm just kidding. I love funfetti icing. So this would make me very happy. I love it. Did you have a technique in frosting it the way you did? My technique was I used a knife. And I just Mm -hmm. frosted as best I could. It's definitely, it looks homemade. It does not look like I didn't try to make it all smooth or anything. I just tried to make it so it covered the cake and it wasn't like too much. Yeah, then I sliced it up and I gave some to my mom and her husband and I had a piece. Did they think it was sad? (laughs) They did. My mom told me when I was putting the frosting on she was like why does it look so dense what did you do wrong I don't understand how you make things and they turn out wrong and And you were like that's the goal here (laughs) I was like well it's supposed to be a sad birthday cake and she's like well what ingredients did you use and I was like you need to stop because you're just making me sad right now and not in a good way (laughs) But I didn't think it was overly dense. I really think part of it is just because it is gray and it looks it looks weird. But she said it tasted good and Carlos liked it too. And in my limited experience, I've made a few cakes now with melted butter instead of whipping the butter and mm. the sugar together. Yeah. I seem to have observed that the melted butter recipes tend to not rise quite as much, as much at least in my mm-hmm. experience but you get a different I don't know crumb. the science behind that so maybe that's just anecdotal <laughs> but I figured it wasn't gonna rise as much as like a cake that was done in a mixer would because I wasn't getting as much air in like I whisked the whole thing and I whisked it mm-hmm. a lot until there were no bumps but I'm just not gonna get the same amount of air as I would in like a stand mixer but I also was trying to be kind to myself and do something that I thought I could actually do and not stress out. And I also thought it would be fun to do this now. And then, you know, next season, we will probably be doing some baking type things. And I'll have my own kitchen and my stand mixer back. So I also kind of wanted to see like, what the difference would be between like this now and then once I actually have my own space. Can I ask why you picked Sad Birthday? I picked Sad Birthday because I was pretty sure I could make a cake. It had been a while. And I just, the juxtaposition of like birthdays, which I find very joyous and like the gray of the sadness just, (laughs) I don't know. I just thought it was hilarious. (laughs) 
And of course, her goal was to make it look sad, but taste great, which I think yes. you've achieved here. Yeah, I do have to say, like, taking those gray cakes out of the oven was a little disconcerting, but I was like, it's all right. <laughs> I know what I put in it, and it's going to taste okay. I love it. I mean, I would have dropped it on the floor for some extra good measure, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's my sad birthday. Um, Yay! Yay. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I would make... I would make a happy birthday cake in the future. I don't know that I would purposely make a sad birthday cake. <laughs> but if I ever need to make a cake that's like gray for Eeyore or something, I know how to make gray out of food coloring. <laughs> would you use this cake recipe again without making it sad? I don't know if I would. Like, it was a pretty simple recipe and it did not rise as much as I would like it to. But I think if I was trying to make something quickly, I might return to this. Like, if I wanted to just make a quick cake and then maybe, you know, zhuzh it up a little bit. It's a good basic recipe. Yeah, well, nice job. Yay. Yay. Sad (laughs) birthday. (laughs) All right, Justine, what did you bring to our potluck today? I've got a food illusion. (laughs) Illusion, Illusion, Michael. Well, I've got a lot. I really brought it this time. So buckle in. But first I want to share, I got to share the illusion before I say what it is okay okay i'm gonna drop the final photo because that's what i really determined it was all about in the end was like it's for the photo like it's for the actual image it's the Mm -hmm. illusion Mm -hmm. so i really put the thought into the setup of the scene and like the angle and everything (laughs) (laughs) so here it is oh my gosh It's breakfast. (laughs) Yeah. That's very cute. (laughs) It looks like avocado toast with bacon Mm -hmm. and eggs. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) All right. So is this the part where we play the game of trying to guess what everything actually is? I mean, that or I can tell you whatever you're into. (laughs) I want to guess. I think it'll be fun. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Well, first off, great picture. This is so much fun. The, The toast looks like maybe banana bread to me the avocado i don't know that just looks like avocado maybe it's mushed up bananas with maybe some green food dye and the bacon quote unquote i don't know maybe that's that banana peel bacon i kept seeing online (laughs) what are those mangoes i'm guessing the eggs are some kind of cupcake yeah i can't tell if that's frosting or like half of a peach I think it might be a peach or like nectarine half on top of, oh. I don't know what. Kind of looks like mashed potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. You guys are so close, actually. Yes, the the eggs are cupcakes. I'm going to show you like a side picture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but on top, uh, the yolk is uh, half an apricot, which Ooh. you can get canned like that. These come in cans like <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. The uh the pepper are is chia seeds. <laughs> so it's just oh. a regular vanilla cupcake. So the the toast is very close, Meg, but is a lemon loaf. It could have oh, been banana okay. bread, but it is in that same variety. The avocado is avocado ice cream <laughs> oh <laughs> and uh, the bacon is actually a uh, big coconut flakes as bacon it's oh, coconut bacon oh i see so oh. it's all dessert <laughs> oh my gosh justine this is so amazing that's really really cool yeah this is really nice Oh my gosh, this is making my mouth water. <laughs> well, I've got lots of leftovers, so come on over. <laughs> Food illusion. I feel like this is going to be the new ghost cake. Ghost cake. Food <laughs> illusion. <laughs> So I wanted to do a food illusion because I felt like it was the only one. I don't want to be like, it was the only one I think I could do. I mean, like vegan food in itself is a food illusion. So I felt a bit experienced in this. As you guys know, I was kind of disappointed in what Sola did. Mm -hmm. Justine, you clearly stumped Sola in (laughs) this challenge. (laughs) definitely a more successful illusion well there are a lot if you actually just like google or whatever go on pinterest and search for like 
April Fool's Day prank food things. There's like a lot of these. So I had like actually like a bunch of different ideas and there are actually a lot of vegan like alternatives. So, but the eggs like just really caught my eye. And then, so I started there with a picture of the eggs that I saw. And then I sort of like built up on it. I was like, I don't want to just make cupcakes. So then I was like, well, what if I did like a full avocado toast breakfast? So then I just put it together myself and searched out. I was like, well, instead of like a rye toast, we can do a loaf. So I was just visually looking at things to be like, what could this be? And uh, for the avocado ice cream, I've got this uh, recipe book here nice cream 80 recipes for healthy homemade vegan ice creams and it's got a recipe for avocado and almond dream ice cream and i actually mm. just added a couple dashes of spirulina powder to mm, it mm-hmm. to up the green factor a couple years ago i got this container for making ice cream when i got this cookbook and it's really helped that device was a dream it's just like a freezable plastic container specifically for if you're making your own ice cream without having like a ice cream machine the ice cream recipe has avocado avocados in it too, ripe avocados, almond milk or other nut milk. I used oat milk, so mine came out a little more oaty flavored, which is fine by me. It was just very nice and smooth. Uh, Three tablespoons of almond butter, eight dates, three tablespoons maple syrup, and uh, a teaspoon vanilla extract. Like I said, I added the spirulina powder. You blend it all in a blender, put it in whatever container, and you just have to churn it every half hour or so for three hours. (laughs) just so it doesn't get all ice crystal-y. That's the only thing about making your own ice cream. I think I did that first. This took me like two days to make everything. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think then I made the cupcakes. So I used that recipe that came with the whole idea. It was really, really uh, basic. Sunny side up cupcakes from Fork and and Beans. The recipe itself calls for gluten-free, but I didn't want to buy extra stuff. So I just use regular AP flour and the cu- and the crumb came out great. So it's definitely swappable. So the cake itself was very light, great crumb, didn't fall apart when I peeled any of the, the paper off, but it just didn't have really any flavor to it. I think if I would make this again, I would add in a dash of vanilla because it it doesn't call for it, but it Mm. just doesn't taste like anything. Now, on the other hand, the frosting is really, really sweet. So that might balance it out, but I actually didn't like this uh, frosting recipe or maybe I had a hard time with it. Because yeah, I want to hear more out, about this frosting. It came out really like granular. It's a uh, non hydrogenated it's shortening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, half a cup of shortening, two and a half cups powdered sugar, a tablespoon non-dairy milk, a teaspoon vanilla extract. Really basic. You're supposed to, you know, use your mixer to get it, whip it, the shortening up first, all fluffy, and then add the powdered sugar and then the vanilla and milk and to keep making sure it's fluffy. I don't know, I just had problems with it and tried adding some more milk, but I don't know. I was getting also down to the line too. I've made other frostings before that were better than this, so I don't know if it was me. (laughs) That's my question about this original recipe. I'm not really sure what the original recipe designer was thinking by wanting to get this consistency in the frosting, Mm -hmm. because I do feel like you could do a more standard frosting and still get the egg illusion. Yeah, I agree. Like that out of everything, and I made a lot, the frosting was the only thing that I was like, eh, I don't know about this. (laughs) (laughs) So I sent you guys a picture of how the apricot uh, halves came directly out of the can and some were broken, but some were just like, this is perfect little egg yolk. (laughs) (laughs) Justine, I have to say looking at your pictures versus the one in the recipe, I, f- I like the way that yours look better. Aw, you're too sweet. <laughs> I, I'm, it's true. I think yours look better. I think they came out pretty great. Um, now moving on, the, the lemon loaf was really basic, really simple. And I mean, I've made loaves for this podcast a couple of times before. This one um, used some vegan yogurt as a base with milk grapeseed oil, a cup of sugar, (laughs) some lemon zest, lemon juice. So that was like really nice and lemony and sweet. Mm. 
flour, baking powder, baking soda, salt, and then it had the lemon glaze on top, which you don't see like in the picture because of course mm. it's on its side, but definitely I still added it and it was yummy. <laughs> Let's see. I think what's left is the coconut bacon. So this is the only thing that I'm like a little fudge on. It does taste like bacon. So I still group that into dessert because bacon can go on desserts. <laughs> it can. There's candied bacon things. Yeah. And you also have to get like the big shred flake ones. Mm-hmm, I don't know mm-hmm. how to describe. Not like the small little like you can pinch it, in, but like the actual like looks like a thin chunk. So it's olive oil, Bragg's liquid aminos, maple syrup, uh, liquid smoke, and smoked paprika, which is pretty much a bacon marinade flavor that I've used before when making mm-hmm. tempeh bacon. Mm-hmm. But it was so much easier with just this because you just have to like toss the the flakes in, bloop bloop bloop, throw it on the the sheet sheet pan, bake for. Actually, it says 15 to 20 minutes, but like I think mine was only, it was done at like 10 because I was like, I don't want burnt bacon. <laughs> just <laughs> at 325. Hot. Amanda runs yeah. cold. <laughs> <laughs> and like you just like start picking it off the pan and chomping it, and you're like, mm, this is good. And all of a sudden you're standing over the pan, just like, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, must save some for <laughs> picture. So what was the texture like with like that bacon and the loaf and the ice cream like all together? That seems like a really interesting combination. Well, I mean, it was good in that it was just very sweet. The loaf definitely held up under the ice cream. Nothing like got too soggy or anything. It was kind of like having like, um, you know, you do like a strawberry shortcake or ice cream. That's what it like reminded me of. But then like the bacon on top was just like the crunchy, uh, sticky bit, sweet, sugary desserts, light in flavor. You get like that citrusy sort of blend to everything. Sweet caramelization of the maple syrup and the bacon. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it was successful. (laughs) I'm very impressed. I think this is a very convincing illusion. And like you were just describing, you really thought about the flavors too. So I'm sure it tasted as good as it looked. And I like that you thought about how the flavors would work together. I don't know how sweet the ice cream was, obviously, because I can't taste it, sadly. But (laughs) I'm getting the impression that, you know, avocado has that kind of like savory taste. Avocado is a little bit earthy in some ways. So I think pairing that with a bright citrus loaf, I think that Mm -hmm. sounds really smart. I like the idea of the crunchy coconut in contrast. Yeah, I think this sounds great. I would eat it. Yay! Yeah, this is. I'm gonna open a restaurant. It's all gonna be just vegan food illusions. (laughs) (laughs) You'll be like, "What am I eating?" (laughs) I don't know. I think you might have an idea there. There might be some legs to that. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) will do. (laughs) Well done, Justine. We are going to take a quick break, and then we will be back to see what Meg has brought us today. And we're back. Meg, what do you have? Okay, so when we were planning out this episode, I said that I wanted to go last, which I feel like is a big mistake now because now I have to follow Justine. Oh, (laughs) hush. (laughs) But the reason why I wanted to go last is because I have the final chicken. (gasps) Oh my god, you brought it! I am showing you the final chicken. Oh, I feel like I'm on that TV show. <laughs> <laughs> so as a quick refresher, this is a reference to what Sola said in the seven course convenience store tasting menu episode in which she presented all of her tasting dishes in these chicken or rooster dishes like glass dishes. And so I wanted to do something from this episode for three reasons, really. And one was that I really, really wanted to use this rooster dish that my parents gifted me. Thank you, mom and dad. I love it. (laughs) So they got me the exact same rooster dish that Sola uses in this episode. You can actually see it in several episodes of Stump Sola because it's in the background set dressing. So I really wanted to recreate that. That was my main goal. Another reason why I wanted to do recipe from this episode is that it's probably my favorite Stump Sola episode. As we talked about in our own Digest podcast episode, I feel like it was really emblematic of the premise of Stump Sola. I feel like it was perfect 
proof of concept and really showed her creativity and like the breadth of her talents. So that's one other reason why I wanted to do something from this episode. And I thought it would be my own way of sort of recreating the Stump Sola premise in a small way, because she has a lot of equipment and techniques that I don't really have in my arsenal. So I thought, well, how can I make this in my own kitchen without, you know, like a dehydrator or whatever? <laughs> so in the episode, the dish that she presented in the the rooster, in the chicken, was the ode to a bodega breakfast. And what she made was a warm, jammy egg with bacon bits that she had glazed in a fruit cocktail juice. And she made a coffee-soaked blueberry muffin foam. So (laughs) the foam was the difficult thing for me here because she uses a whipping canister or an extruding canister. This is this restaurant-quality piece of equipment that uses, like, nitrous oxide canisters, I believe it is. Not something I have in my kitchen. (laughs) So I was like, okay, everything else seems easy enough, but how to do this foam? I guess I'll share the photos with you now. All right, I've shared the photos. (laughs) I'm afraid I didn't take any making of photos, which I'm realizing now is just the final presentation. But I was really thinking about presentation, kind of like Justine, but... (laughs) But I was more thinking along the lines of, I want to like recreate that tasting menu feeling. And Solo is saying a tasting menu has little tiny bits. You leave feeling hungry. So I thought it would be kind of fun to just make a sort of pretentious looking presentation almost and just have fun with it. (laughs) I love it. So the jammy egg was really easy to make. I just soft boiled an egg in my Dash Express egg cooker. I love this egg cooker. If you want to sponsor us, Dash, I will gladly say (laughs) how much I love this egg cooker. (laughs) But so soft boiling that egg was really easy. For the bacon, I just used some vegan bacon and cooked it up in a pan on the stovetop. And I did brush a little bit of orange juice on top to kind of replicate the fruit cocktail juice. But as she said in the episode, you couldn't really taste it. And I kind of agreed I couldn't taste the orange juice either because the vegan bacon was already flavored with a bunch of seasonings. So the juice didn't come across to me either. But, you know, I recreated the Sola experience. (laughs) Also with the bacon, that's the little square that you see in the photo. Mm -hmm. I just thought it would be cute to make a little amuse-bouche looking thing of bacon. Also in the episode, it's not really clear how Sola ultimately incorporates the bacon in the final presentation, so I thought I would just have a little bit of fun with it. And then the coffee blueberry muffin foam. What she did was she toasted bits of a blueberry muffin, and then she steeped that in coffee for a while, and then she blended all of that together with a little bit more coffee, And that was the mixture that she put in the canister that she then created a foam out of. So I was like, well, I can't do that. So what can I do? And I was reminded of this really popular recipe from early lockdown 2020, kind of in the banana bread sourdough era. And it was this (laughs) recipe called Dalgona coffee. It was kind of like a novelty coffee trend. It's equal parts, instant coffee crystals, sugar, and boiling water. And I'm not clear of the science behind it, but this combination, when you whip it, you get a dense foam. It's almost like whipped cream. It kind of acts like whipped cream. So you whip it, you get this dense, creamy coffee substance. So I made that because I had made it in 2020 (laughs) following the trend. (laughs) So I knew it worked. I knew it would give me this nice foam. And I thought, well, how to add blueberry muffin flavor to it? So I got some freeze-dried blueberries and I pulverized those in my food processor. So I added those with the coffee crystals and I added a dash of vanilla extract because kind of like you were saying, Justine, you felt that your cupcakes could have had more flavor if only there was some vanilla extract. And Mm -hmm. really the vanilla, that is kind of the forward flavor in cakes, muffins, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So I thought the vanilla would give it that sort of cakey flavor without actually having an actual blueberry muffin. So that's what I used for the foam and I whipped it all up according to the recipe and then I piped it on top as you see in the photo so yeah I basically put it all together (laughs) it was pretty good tasting so the way that you're meant to enjoy this coffee foam is that you're supposed to put it on top of milk 
and then mix it all together. So by itself, the coffee foam has very concentrated, very strong coffee flavor. It's almost like eating coffee grounds. (laughs) So (laughs) since that wasn't the intended way of having this coffee, it was very strong coffee flavor. But when I got a piece of a little bit of the foam, some of the egg, some of the bacon, all of the elements together were actually really nice. It was that creamy, yolky, savory flavor of the egg, and then you had the bittersweet coffee foam and a little extra savory note from the bacon. So all together, I thought it was really nice. I didn't make ramen paratha like Sola did, (laughs) but I did make toast soldiers from brioche bread. So that's what I used for dunking. And it, yeah, it was tasty. It was fun to make. It was tasty. I would probably just make a soft boiled egg for myself next time. <laughs> <laughs> this is so genius, man. <laughs> it really is. You're like, oh, I don't have this fancy kitchen equipment, but I still know how to make coffee foam. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, 2020 trends. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. That's very Stump Sola, something that reminds us of 2020. (laughs) Oh, that's true. (laughs) I hadn't thought of that. (laughs) I love it. I think the second picture is my favorite because I just like the balance of the chicken looming over the beautiful masterpiece. (laughs) Yeah, the chicken kind of staring at the egg like, what have you done? Is that that a bed of salt that you have the egg sitting on? It is. So I looked in the video and I really wanted to recreate how she did the presentation. And she seemed to have put either sugar or salt in the bottom of the rooster dish to hold the eggshell. So yeah, I poured some salt in there and used that to cradle the egg. Nice. This is so good. This is so good. Oh my goodness. I just keep staring at it. Yeah, same. I'm just like, wow. (laughs) So something fun that I learned and used for the first time was an egg cracker or an egg topper. Have you guys ever Mm. used one of these? Heard of it. Yeah. I've not used it, but yeah, heard of it. Yeah. So like looking at the photo and I've seen this and when people have served soft boiled eggs before and I've always wondered, well, how do you just take the top off of a cooked egg, you know? And the answer is an egg topper. So it's, I brought it with me here to show Justine and Amanda, but to describe it to the listener, it's this metal cup that you put over the top of the egg and then there's a handle and then it has a spring loaded plunger. So basically you put the egg under the cup and then you pull up the plunger and release it. And it's just kind of, I think physics probably, the egg sort of bursts out, but since there's the metal cup containing it, it bursts against the cup and makes a nice even scored ring in the eggshell along the top Mm. that you can then just remove. So that's kind of how it works. It's interesting. It it works better and more easily than I thought it would. I love building up the tools we have in our kitchen. I mean, for mine as well, I've used a bunch of tools that I've acquired since this podcast, even just like a microplane for zesting and the lemon juicer. We know which one. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, we'll have a whole arsenal of kitchen goods. The cherry pitter, which Justine just said she wanted to borrow the other day. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) That's the thing. We also need to start living near each other because (laughs) we want to borrow each other's tools. I know. I feel like when Jeremy and I are unpacking our kitchen after having all of our kitchenware in boxes for years, I'm going to be like, oh my God, guys, look at this. Look what I have. I forgot. I have this thing. I'm like, I'm just... It's going to be like unwrapping all of our wedding gifts again because we haven't seen so much of it since like the year after we got married. Meg, would you make this again? Probably not. It wasn't high effort, but it wasn't low, low effort either. But, you know, it's basically a soft boiled egg with some bits on top. I didn't particularly like that brand of vegan bacon, so I probably wouldn't do that one again. It never really crisped up. It just sort of stayed soggy the whole time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I would definitely make a soft-boiled egg again. I make soft-boiled eggs all the time. I eat eggs for lunch constantly, (laughs) (laughs) so I would definitely do that. I think I've made the Dalgona coffee maybe twice. It is quite strong, and it is, you know, it's a trend. It's a gimmick. It was for the gram was why it was popular, essentially. So, 
not high on my list of ways to ingest coffee, but you know, I've got the coffee crystals now, so I probably will make it again. (laughs) Would you make this for a fancy dinner party? (laughs) (laughs) Maybe with some tweaks. I do think I would want to do something to make the coffee foam a little less strong, or -hmm. maybe I would just be sure to let everyone know that, oh, you should really try to get a little bit of everything at once. Like, don't just eat the coffee foam straight because it's a bit much. <laughs> when Meg has her her tasting menu dinner party. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and I open my food illusion restaurant and <laughs> Exactly. I'll just make birthday cakes but not sad for people. <laughs> well, great job pot looking guys. Woo, Go I loved it. us. So God, exciting. we're so good. <laughs> <laughs> We are going to move on to the back burner. So we wanted to highlight today, um, Deadline released uh, some upcoming Food Network programming and Hawa is getting her own cooking show. And we have discussed her before uh, back in the uh, Bon Appetit days. And I'm very excited that she is gonna have her own show on Food Network It's going to be called Spice of Life. It will see Hawa Hassan visit experienced chefs at home and in restaurants to learn the stories of their favorite traditional recipes from around the world. Yeah, get that money. I'm glad she has her own show. Mm -hmm. She deserves that. Yeah, it's been actually almost exactly a year now since all of the stuff at Bon Appetit went down. And so now a year later... We can see where are they now. And it's really encouraging to see people like Hawa, Sola, Rick getting their own opportunities, getting their own shows, getting their own cookbooks. So I'm glad that out of such a shitty situation that there have been opportunities for these folks to advance their careers. Some of the other shows that were announced for Food Network, um, because they've got a bunch of programming. I didn't include all of it, because if you follow Hollywood stuff, Discovery and Warner Brothers combined, and Food Network is part of Discovery, and now the whole thing. So they're going to be pumping out a bunch more content But some of the other shows that were announced were um, Money Hungry, which is going to be hosted by Cal Penn. It's a contest show that requires the abilities of a super taster combined with wide reaching culinary knowledge to complete a series of increasingly difficult taste tests encompassing the entire world of flavors. Mm. I thought this just sounded really interesting like I feel like this would be like I mean I'm not a super taster but like I'm like oh I just get to try food and I don't have to like have a contest where I have to bake (laughs) in front of someone I just have to taste food okay I don't know it just sounded really interesting to me do you think Chris Morocco will be on this oh my god (laughs) I've always liked Cal Penn and I always think it's interesting to see the different things that he he does with his his fame and his platform And then uh, one of the other ones is the Try Guys, which I know um, we have mentioned on the show before. They are going to be fronting No Recipe Road Trip with the Try Guys, inspired by um, their web series Without a Recipe. I do find their Without a Recipe videos quite entertaining because it's exactly what it sounds like. They try to create a dish with little knowledge and with (laughs) no recipe, often to hilarious results. (laughs) Yeah, I definitely thought, okay, I would watch this. I mean, I enjoyed the Try Guys, especially uh, Eugene Lee Yang, so... He's the one that actually makes something good. He's just effortly, effortlessly talented. So he'll be like, oh, I whipped together this amazing cake <laughs> and it tastes amazing. And everyone's like, Eugene, how could you? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have some shout outs to round out the episode. We want to thank everyone who celebrated National Donut Day with us this weekend, including Amuse Boosh podcast, Nat on Twitter, Weirdly Strange Florida, and our resident podcast mom, Mary. (laughs) National Donut Day, is that your favorite holiday, Justine? Yes. I I instantly thought of you as soon as I saw the picture. I was like, Justine, it's your day. Did you eat? (laughs) 
Did you eat a donut on National Donut Day? No, I did not. Aww. I mean, there's this great place around the corner, Faux Nuts, which is vegan and gluten-free. I could go whenever. I just could not that day. That's a great name. I applaud that <laughs> name. <laughs> and then we'd also like to thank everybody for the positive feedback um, on our new merch that we announced recently. So thanks for uh, the feedback. Hey, Jen Owens and Janelle Wilkie. I also really want our new bag. Podappetite.threadless.com get you one (laughs) (laughs) so thank you um for getting in touch with us on social media and sharing your thoughts with us this week we'd like to share a review we got a five-star review from mrs casper the friends you didn't know you need she writes i got a mac at work and now i have an apple id and now i can leave a review you are so welcome (laughs) Um, She goes on, there are a lot of things I could say about this podcast, but I want to share specifically what it means to me. As a millennial going through a pandemic, I have a pretty small circle. My friends are almost all online friends, and I've been pretty hunkered down for the last year. There have been a lot of lonely times, and there have been a lot of quiet mornings at work where I have been a little adrift in my own difficulties. Podcasts in general are where I find the most peace, and Pod Appetit is where I find my joyful peace. These women, you guys, they're close with each other, and that closeness makes for a welcoming and sparkling podcast that floats down like a group of fairy godmothers, changing the dress from pink to blue to pink again. They are the Prosecco of podcasts, sweet and ready to make you giggle. When life crashes down, when the publication they used to review was dismantled, Pot Appetit has been there, real and present, like you wish you could have been with your friends this last year. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just... Okay. Maybe I need another hobby or something, but the hour I spend with these ladies each week or so is a time I feel like a girl hanging with her friends, even if I'm alone in my kitchen. Also, tell LJ the baby is cute, but she is missed. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Amanda's legit Amanda crying. Is crying. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had trouble reading at the end because there were tears in my eyes. It's just... <laughs> Thank like seriously, thank you. I know that we love doing this, um, and it's been a rough a rough year and um I'm so grateful to have I mean, like Justine and Meg and LJ in my life and that we have this and that people listen at all is just amazing. So thank you. This feedback is it's amazing to read. It's something that I've saved to my computer, the screenshot, you know, and can pull it out whenever I feel like I need a little cheering up or like, oh, Mm -hmm. I'd like to be reminded that there are people who listen and appreciate what we're doing. And yeah, you've been such, such a a great friend to the podcast, Mrs. Casper. And I think that we can consider you an honorary pal, Mm -hmm. (laughs) pot appetite lady. Yeah, you're definitely in our circle. So yes, if you want to make me cry on air, (laughs) write us a review. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you all for joining us this week. Next time on the podcast... Drumroll! <gasps> we begin season five! Join us as we dive into the Netflix series... Nadia Bakes! Woo! Yeah! Real <laughs> recipes for Justine. <laughs> See you guys next time. Bye! Bye! Thanks for listening to Pot Appetit Gourmet Takes. We'd love to hear from you. So find us on Twitter and Instagram at pod underscore appetite. And on Facebook at Pod Appetit Podcast. You can also email us at podappetitepodcast at gmail.com and find all of our episodes on our website, podappetitepodcast.com. Hello there. I'm Erica, your host of the Les Represent podcast. We talk to female identifying women from all walks and paths of life. We talk about anything, their experiences, their stories, their projects, their favorite food, even their pets names, anything. And what do we all have in common, you ask? Well, we're all queer. And in the world when the media, society, and even our parents are telling us who we are and how to identify, sometimes we just need to speak for ourselves. So sit back, grab a snack, and listen to our conversations. Get to know someone. You might find, regardless of country, generation, or orientation, you might have more in common than you think. Oh, and sometimes my co-host will chime in with something to say.
You can find our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify.